Five British men appear in court charged with plotting to kill soldiers or police officers in London. Police claim the men had sworn allegiance to Islamic State. It comes on the day Scotland Yard says it's stretched dealing with 100 terror threats a week. Also tonight, hope for the release of 200 Nigerian schoolgirls abducted by Boko Haram. A ceasefire is agreed and talks may begin. 29 are dead in a Himalayan storm. British trekkers are still unaccounted for. And farmers protest as supermarkets slash the cost of a pint of milk. This is ITV News at 6.30 with Ranveer Singh and James Mates. Good evening. On the day Scotland Yard admitted it was dealing with terror threats on an unprecedented scale, it charged five men in connection with an alleged plot to kill police officers or soldiers on the streets of Britain. It's alleged they'd sworn an allegiance to the so-called Islamic State. Among the long list of allegations, they're also accused of conducting hostile reconnaissance of a police station and army barracks and of planning an attack using mopeds for a possible drive-by shooting. Our correspondent Juliet Bremner was in court. The five men in court today are all accused of being involved in a plot to shoot and kill police officers or soldiers on the streets of London. Security was at its tightest, an armed escort on the ground and a helicopter monitoring the journey from above. 21-year-old Tari Kassane, a medical student, was led into court with Suhab Majid, a 20-year-old from West London, 24-year-old Niall Hamlet and two other men, Moman Matasim and Nathan Cuffey. The defendants were led into the dock by police officers wearing stab-proof vests. As the charges were read out, itemised into 21 different allegations, many of them smiled or smirked, hiding their laughter behind their hands. Amongst the long list of allegations they're facing, taking an oath of allegiance to the proscribed group Islamic State, conducting hostile reconnaissance of Shepherd's Bush Police Station and White City Territorial Army Barracks, discussing and sourcing the use of a firearm and viewing and retaining an image of two metropolitan police officers. Arrests were carried out in the early hours of the morning 10 days ago. Police have been questioning the men since then. Prosecutor Mark Dawson told the court it is a plot, albeit not fully formulated, to shoot to kill police officers or soldiers on the streets of London. The charges come on the same day that Scotland Yard admitted it was stretched by the exceptionally high number of counter-terrorism cases. We're working flat out to take on this threat. That ranges from disrupting individuals um, for minor offences, the sort of Achilles heel type approach, to, to um, stopping plots and we're sort of probably disrupting several plots a year. The five men who appeared today have been remanded in custody. Juliet Bremner, ITV News, Westminster Magistrates Court. The chief economist of the Bank of England today told ITV News that Britain would not see a rise in interest rates until next summer at the earliest. Andy Haldane, a member of the committee that sets rates, said that energy in the recovery had dropped and the global economy was slowing. He talked to our business editor, Richard Edgar. These houses are going up, but the mortgages to buy them aren't. Interest rates are likely to stay at record lows for many more months, according to this man who helps to set them. Andy Haldane is chief economist of the Bank of England. We met in Warwick as part of his visit to gauge the real economy. So you've come up to a construction site here in the West Midlands, one of thousands around the country. Isn't this exactly the sort of sign of a booming economy that, that needs to be controlled by higher interest rates? Well, it is booming around here, and construction's done very well. But what's true of construction isn't true of every sector, isn't true of every region of the UK. And this, in part, is prompting a much softer line on interest rates than he was advocating in June. At his office in the Bank of England, he told me why. I thought rate rises might usefully come sooner rather than later. That was three months ago. The weather was warm. The weather's got cooler. Um, in the global economy, certainly, we've seen some of the energy of the recovery reduced. And here in the UK, we've seen inflationary pressures 
from wages, but also from oil prices, from commodity prices, also heading south. Nick Rowley is one of those whose low wages are helping keep inflation low. At the hospital in the Midlands where he works, he tells me he hasn't had a pay rise for five years. It's becoming a struggle now. I'm having to rely on overtime, and if there's no overtime, I've got to make a choice. Do I pay a bill or do I get better food in? Now you've got a mortgage and we think that rates are going to stay low for a little bit longer. How does that play into your, your budget? It helps to know it's going to be fixed rates, but for how long? A question I put to Mr Halding back at the Bank of England. If you believe financial markets, they're now betting somewhere in the middle of uh, next year. Perhaps that's not a bad bet. A bet on cheaper borrowing for a bit longer that anyone buying a house might now take. Well, Richard, Mr Haldane has changed his mind on, on how long it's going to take for interest rates to eventually go up. How significant is this? Well, I think significant because of who he is. Um, he's one of nine votes on this influential committee that sets interest rates. Um, uh, and his is a very influential voice. He was one of the people um, who uh, brought expectations of an early interest rate rise um, back in June when it looked like the economy um, was almost ready for the end of the emergency treatment of, of low interest rates. And the fact that he is now highlighting... Um, um, some of the concerns about the slowdown in the global economy, in particular um, Europe, which may affect our economy as well, coupled with the already um, very slow pace of inflation, which doesn't need any higher interest rates just yet. Um, well, that's been taken seriously by investors, and um, we saw the value of the pound um, dip a little bit um, this morning. But although um, he is doing a job of managing our expectations, he chose his words carefully. This is a bet about rates rising in the middle of next year. Richard, thank you. Footballer Chad Evans says he'll make a very personal and profound video statement next week following his release from prison. The former Sheffield United striker left jail in Lancashire in the early hours of this morning, having served half of a five-year sentence for rape. The 25-year-old insists he is innocent and will clear his name. No decision has yet been made on whether he'll be allowed to play again. David Cameron claimed today that Britain is leading the way in helping tackle Ebola in West Africa and he urged other countries to do more. Those calls were echoed today by one of the scientists who first discovered the virus. Professor Peter Peart says the world is not doing enough. This report from our political correspondent, Carl Dinan. Sailing towards the outbreak zone, the Royal Navy medical ship RFA Argos the latest British addition to the mission to combat the spread of Ebola in Sierra Leone. Her 400 personnel will train and care for medical teams in the front line. Their families know they will face a strange and unfamiliar enemy. I think you'd be a bit weird if you weren't worried, like I am worried, but I think that um, sometimes you join the armed forces to try and make a difference and I think it's um, a really good mission to make a difference. They're going out there to protect their own families and, and people back in the UK and the rest of the world from the spread of Ebola. Today, one of the scientists who discovered the Ebola virus told ITV News that Europe in particular needed to do more. I'm particularly disappointed in European countries, um, except for the UK, which is really doing a fantastic job. Cuba has sent doctors, China has sent uh, mobile laboratories, and, uh, but Europe is not there, so we need to do more. Attending an international conference in Milan, the Prime Minister echoed those sentiments. We're doing a huge amount and I think it's time for other countries to look at their responsibilities and their resources and act in a similar way to what Britain is doing in Sierra Leone, America's doing in Liberia, France is doing in Guinea. Other countries now need to step forward with the resources and the action. In the United States, the first nurse to contract the virus, Nina Pham, has been taken to a new isolation unit. She seems to be improving, albeit emotional. Yet for now, even her tears of happiness must be treated as a potential biohazard. The Argus's mission does not include taking Ebola patients on board, but the virus in West Africa is out of control. There is no telling what her crew will face when they arrive. Carl Dinan, ITV News. 
There's hope tonight that a deal is close to secure the release of 200 schoolgirls abducted in Nigeria by the Islamist group Boko Haram. Their disappearance in April sparked a global appeal for their safe return. And our international affairs editor, Ragi Omar, is here. You've been looking at what this deal may mean. Could it lead to something? Well, it could do simply because it carries the name of the chief of the Nigerian Defence Staff, Air Marshal Bade, and the presidential spokesman who broke the news after meetings with uh, a delegation from neighbouring Cameroon. Um, and that is a very high source. There's been indications that the Nigerian government has been trying to get a release, given that it took such a battering, and particularly the military, for its handling of the situation. All we know about the girls thus far over the last six months is that they've been held in very remote areas in northern uh, Nigeria, in jungle areas. Um, Sometimes some of them reportedly having been moved across the border to Cameroon or even into Chad. What we know is that a ceasefire has been agreed between Nigeria and Boko Haram. That's what the Nigerian authorities have said. There will be talks in a week's time to build on that and hopefully then strike a deal for the 200 or up to 219 mm. girls to be released. But some indications that a process is in the works and hopeful simply because of the seniority of the people expressing such hopes. But it's no more than just a sign at the moment. Raggy Omar, many thanks. Still to come, a British survivor tells of his ordeal as a snowstorm kills dozens in the Himalayas. A former hostage of Islamic State on his time being held prisoner alongside British hostages. And why this farmer thinks supermarket price wars have gone too far those stories and more after the break. Welcome back. A British survivor of Tuesday's storms that killed at least 29 trekkers in the Himalayas says guides who ignored weather warnings effectively herded people to their deaths. Paul Sheridan was one of those fortunate to escape alive from the slopes of the Annapurna range in central Nepal. Many trekkers, including some Britons, remain unaccounted for. Rebecca Barry reports. Back to safety, but still clearly in shock. Others were not so lucky. Their bodies transferred to hospital in Kathmandu. For days, rescuers have been struggling to reach hikers trapped along this popular Himalayan route following a violent storm. Many bodies are still to be recovered from the snow. ITV News spoke to Paul Sheridan, a policeman from Doncaster, seen here on the right. This photo was taken earlier in his trip to Nepal, days before the blizzards hit. The wind whipped up again and we all sort of fell to the floor. We sort of all held each other on the floor for fear of being blown away, basically. And I cried. I cried because I felt that not only had I saved my life, I felt as though that I'd saved the life of other people. It was mostly young, inexperienced hikers who were caught in the storm in Nepal's Annapurna range. So far, 16 bodies have been recovered from the Thoronglā Pass. At least 10 are still missing. Avalanches killed eight trekkers near Fu village and five climbers at Mount Daulagiri. And there's been no contact at all with about 100 hikers in the upper Dolpo range. 50 miles northwest. Some survivors say their guides weren't properly equipped. I think that everybody there was really frightened. We, we all thought that some, somebody going to die and maybe we going to die. October is the busiest month for trekking here because the weather is usually clear and sunny. Now it could be the month of Nepal's worst mountaineering tragedy. Rebecca Barry, ITV News. Fresh clashes have broken out in Hong Kong between riot police and pro-democracy activists. Officers used pepper spray and batons to fend off the crowd who were trying to reclaim a protest site after it was cleared by police earlier today. A former hostage of the so-called Islamic State has given his first detailed account of the time he spent in a cell with other prisoners, including the Britons David Haynes and Alan Henning. In an interview with ITV News, Nicolas Hénin says he remains hopeful another British hostage, John Cantley, will be freed. Neil Connery went to France to meet him. Nicolas Hénin was held for nine months as one of the Western hostages in Syria. Released in April, he's watching the horror of this hostage crisis from a unique and traumatic viewpoint. 
he told me of his closeness to the two murdered British hostages. I was very close to both uh, Alan Henning and, uh, and especially David Haynes. I mean, uh, Alan Henning was also someone who was a total innocent. He spoke of David Haynes' motivation as an aid worker in Syria. He decided to, to, to dedicate to the humanitarian action. I mean, these people are, I, I find it really immoral to have killed them. How do you cope from your unique perspective? There is no privacy when you're stuck together in, uh, in a room like this, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We were receiving little information, very little information about the outside world. We were trying to, uh, to exercise a bit, but uh, we were missing uh, space. He spoke of his hopes that British journalist John Cantley's appearances in Islamic State propaganda videos could save his life. I'm optimistic that uh, the lectures that uh, the captors have asked uh, him to deliver will be a way for him to pay for his life. Nicola says American Peter Kasich, who's still being held, is one of a number of hostages who converted to Islam in captivity. When we were first put in the same, uh, in the same cell, uh, he told me uh, that he converted at a very early stage in his captivity. Every day, Nicola's thoughts are with those he left behind. To see people being taken uh, off the, the cell to be killed must... Uh, yeah, be uh, extremely harsh to them. Nicola and I'm talking to Neil Connery. Oscar Pistorius will find out next Tuesday whether or not he's going to jail for killing his girlfriend. The athlete sobbed in court as his lawyer called him a broken man who had lost everything. The prosecution called for a minimum 10 years in jail. Our Africa correspondent Rohit Katru heard the closing arguments at the court in Pretoria. After eight months on trial, this might be the last time that Oscar Pistorius leaves here a free man. On Tuesday night, it might be the bars of Pretoria prison that he's behind. Today was the final chance for lawyers to argue about what his punishment should be. He wept as his lawyer said he'd been broken and vilified. He's lost everything. He was an icon in the eyes of South Africans on what he has done, what he has achieved. He was denigrated to the extent that all that was left was a rage killer, a cold-blooded killer, a liar, and everything that's horrible. He lost all his sponsors. He lost all his money. He has nothing, my lady. That's not the parents of Reva Steenkamp watched as Pistorius's lawyers argued for a non-custodial sentence. Prosecutors eyes. responded, saying he must go to jail. The minimum term that society will be happy with will be a 10 years imprisonment sentence. It's been a long trial, but the sentence might be much longer. 15 years in prison, perhaps, or community service might be the punishment. That will be the judge's decision, and she'll share it on Tuesday morning. Rohit Katru, ITV News, Pretoria. As you may have noticed, the price of milk has been slashed, the result of supermarket price wars, with one chain now offering four pints for just 89 pence. Good for us, perhaps, but many dairy farmers have had enough. They've held a number of protests, with more planned. Our correspondent Debbie Edwards spent the day with one farmer in Cheshire who says the cuts have gone too far. Andrew Wright's day starts at 5 a.m. He gathers his herd in for their first milk of the day. It takes three hours for him to get 135 cows through the milking parlour. Every morning, every day of the year, there's a strict process to follow. Farm work is hard and it's constant. But this year, the price of milk has dropped so sharply, what farmers are putting in no longer matches what they're getting out. We're looking at, for our November delivered milk, we're going to be probably six to seven people a litre worse off than we were 
at April, in April. A 1p um, per litre drop in milk price equates to about £15,000, so therefore six pence equates to £90,000, and that's straight off the bottom line. Last night, Andrew joined this protest at a supermarket distribution depot. Yeah, yeah. No chance to let this be at the moment. OK. For two weeks, farmers have been taking action against retailers that have slashed their milk prices. The protests have prompted the government to hold talks with the dairy industry next week. The UK produces 38 million litres of milk a day. That's 67 million pints. This farm alone produces 4,000 litres a day. But the problem here is not with production, it's with price. Andrew says when his business suffers, so do others. We have a, a regular machinery replacement programme. Um, that has now been put on hold. The old adage has always been that an awful lot of people swing off a cow's tail because the, you know, the milk price filters down a long, long way. Encouraging the supermarkets to raise the price of a pint won't be easy, but the country's dairy farmers are prepared for a fight. Debbie Edward, ITV News, Sandbach in Cheshire. Tonight's main news. Five men have been charged with planning a terrorist attack on British soil. It's alleged the men who were arrested in operations over the last fortnight were plotting to kill police officers or soldiers on the streets of London. And finally, it was a very different room with a view for Oscar-winning actress Dame Maggie Smith today. The 79-year-old was made a companion of honour by the Queen in recognition of a glittering career on stage, screen and TV. The actress, whose recent work includes roles in the Harry Potter films and, of course, ITV's Downton Abbey, joins an illustrious group of recipients who include Professor Stephen Hawking and Sir David Attenborough. She's a class act. Coming up on ITV News at 10. He never said he didn't want to play Liverpool defend their young player Raheem Sterling in the club versus country controversy. And the riddle of the sands, how a piece of history that was not so much ancient Egypt as old-time Hollywood. It emerged from the Californian desert. Please join us both later for that, but for now, from the two of us, bye-bye.